My name is Andrea Poli. I'm a professor of art uh, and computer science at UNM. Uh, but here today, my role, I'm speaking in my role as um, a member of SciArt Santa Fe, which is an organization that promotes excellence in art science uh, at that intersection that some people call SciArt, we call SciArt. Uh, one of the way we do, ways we do that is by hosting these lasers, uh, which are Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. They happen uh, all around the world, and we're happy to be the New Mexico hosts for lasers uh, sponsored, started by the Leonardo uh, Society, International Society for Art, Science, and Technology. Um, you can join our mailing list uh, to find out about our upcoming programs, um, sciartsantafe.org. Um, and we're thankful for generous support from the NEA, New Mexico Arts, New Mexico Humanities Council, from individuals in our community, and our great partners, like Sala, I'm looking for Alan, uh, yeah. and, uh, and uh, Kevin, that amazing, thank you so much for um, giving us this opportunity to do this in Los Alamos. Um, and um, I also want to thank uh, the UNM uh, Confluence uh, Low Residency MFA program. There's a number of students here um, who just came off of camping in Abiquiu <laughs> and uh, harvesting clay and, and uh, they'll be doing a pit fire and, and now they're here in Los Alamos. And I just think that's so wonderful to see. Um, I think it gives it I hope that um, this is giving you a perspective uh, maybe on some of the complexities here in New Mexico and in, in the U.S. and the Southwest. Um, I don't know how much, uh, speaking to the MFA Confluence um, students, you've researched about Los Alamos and about this region, uh, but I encourage you to, to do so. Um, a lot to to think about, um, and I also want to thank Cheryl Padberg, my co wonderful colleague, and my wonderful colleague um, Mary Mattingly, who's here somewhere, <laughs> um, who are teaching in the uh, Confluence program and are, are amazing artists in their own right and um, doing some wonderful things. So I am really talking a lot. I apologize. Um, so. I'm so pleased to um, be able to introduce Marta de Menendez and Luis Gracia. Um, they have been here since January. Uh, Marta has been a Fulbright Scholar in Residence uh, in my lab at the New University of New Mexico doing bio art. Uh, we're here at Los Alamos in part um, because Luis is, uh, as an immunologist, is doing some wonderful research here with scientists um, like Rui, uh, Roberto is in the back, um, uh, related to COVID, related to uh, the immune system. That's really uh, fascinating and important work. So um, I, I just want to say, I, you know, maybe rather than reading the bios, I just, <laughs> I just want to say, you know, having Marta and Luis here has been such a revelation for um, the BioArt program and just for um, you know, what we've been trying to do with Sutter at Santa Fe and in many, many different areas to um, not only their extensive connections around the world in BioArt uh, and connecting to those, but to see a way of working in art and science that is so, um, meaningful and powerful um, and but also done in such a way that's has such joy and fun and bravery <laughs> I think um, I wasn't so brave in my lab and Marta has shown me a way uh, which is really wonderful so uh, I'm just so excited to introduce them and so without any further ado <laughs> Hello everybody. I tend to move my arms, so this is going to be fun. If you can't hear me, let me know. But this may happen a few times. I'll try to keep. <laughs> uh, I'll try to tuck my 
elbows in and, and not move too much my arms, but we'll see. Um, so thank you, Andrea, for having us here. I think it's, uh, it's great for both of us to uh, be invited to do these things. We host together the laser in Lisbon. And so it, we understand what it means to organize all these things and to have this, and you have so many more than we do. Um, thank you, Sala, for having us. I did come to the uh, presentation that you gave of your new plans, uh, and it was mind-blowing. And there's obviously a million ideas coming to my mind every time I think about it, so I'll keep shut. <laughs> because I can't do everything everywhere. Um, and you already have here so many amazing people to work with you. Um, so I'll start. Uh, so Luis and I are going to talk about how we work together. And, um, and we'll, we'll talk about art and immunologist. Uh, immunology, I'm an artist. He's an immunologist. We've been together for a very long time. And. Uh, I was trained as a classical artist, so I'm going to introduce myself a little bit, so this is why also it's not important for Andrea to read our um, biographies. So I was trained very much as a classical artist. My, my background is completely art. I have no formal background in science. My last science subject that I did was in high school. Uh, so I, I have officially a painting degree from the Fine Arts School of Lisbon. And actually, my graduation project, my, my last studio project, was my first project in uh, art and biology. It's um, the project Nature, with a question mark. So I'm not going to talk about all of the works that I've done, because this was in 1999, and we're not in 1999 anymore. So I have been doing a lot of works. Uh, and since that first project, Basically, I've been going through many different labs, working in many different projects with many different scientists. And throughout this uh, path, I realized a few things, and some things were pointed out to me very clearly. So at some point in my uh, career, someone at a venue like this, the question that they made was not a question, it was a commentary. And they said, you do realize that all your artworks are about identity. And it had never occurred to me that all of the works that I did were about identity. So after that, it's an affirmation that I put forward. Everything that I do, and I'm fascinated by that subject, everything that I do in art relates to somehow something that challenges my conceptions on identity. And so this means that I go around different labs depending on, on whatever question, whatever challenge, I go through. So I've been in, sorry, no, it's going too far. I've been in many different labs. I've been in uh, biology, microbiology labs. I've been in uh, um, functional, functional magnetic resonance uh, laboratories doing um, um, medical imaging, I've worked with uh, um, comparing DNA of different species and even comparing DNA, DNA of different humans. I have worked in um, cell biology labs. I have grown wheat on top of a Bible. Um, I have worked uh, with uh, CRISPR uh, technologies altering different organisms uh, genetically and non-genetically. And so during all this time, working with scientists in so many different places, and having been a, a student of fine arts, I learned during my degree, and if you're an art student, maybe you will relate to this, I learned very quickly not to try and answer the question, what is art? It's strange for scientists when I tell them that you really, it's a, it's a trap. You learn very quickly that it's a trap. When someone asks you in an art environment, what is art, you know you're going to have to reference, I don't know how many philosophers, and say that it's a complicated thing, and you never reach any kind of conclusion. And for, if you try to do this with a scientist, they go, what are you talking about? Okay. 
And this is a very interesting thing because from the very beginning of my career, from the last project of my degree, I was working with scientists on a daily basis, so I was always asked this question, what is art? Why do you say that the job that you're doing here is going to become an art piece? Especially when they look at me and see me at the bench doing exactly the same things as they're doing. So it was a very complicated thing to do, and it was really difficult to overcome as a question. What is art? And so having a life partner that was already with me at the very beginning, who's an immunologist, I, I'm a little bit contrary and vindic vindictive, so I asked, what is immunology? Maybe I, that will help. OK. <laughs> Deflect. <laughs> <laughs> so Martha was, Martha has been uh, working, we have a kind of a mirror uh, trajectory. Martha comes from the art work, art world, and works in research laboratories. I have a, a, a scientific background, and I've started receiving artists in my laboratory, collaborating with scientists to do artworks. And although these are kind of mirror images, uh, immunology is really tough, and in fact, uh, Mother said Sorry. that she started working with scientists in 99, and it was um, I don't know, more than 15 years later that we did the first project together. And uh, now, immunology became more fashionable, because before the pandemic, uh, hardly anyone really cared about immunology. And I know this because I was interviewing graduate students. And these graduate students, they wanted to do uh, cancer biology, neurosciences, or whatever. But immunology was not usually on the top of their priorities. Come COVID-19, and now immunology has a different standing in the, the objectives of the students. And uh, this is, I think, a result of our understanding of the beauty of immunology, and this is what I want to convey you in five minutes. The first <laughs> problem was that immunology was really tough for artists because uh, you cannot picture anything when you talk about immunology. Take the heart. The heart, everybody knows what is the heart. The heart is an icon that is very easily identifiable by anyone, and uh, Take the brain, nobody has questions about the representation of the brain. One picture is sufficient for you to identify the brain. Even the muscle skeletal system can be very easily identified. But then, what does the immune system look like? How, what do you think is the immune system? So if we ask Google, and now everybody asks Google what the immune system looks like, this is the first picture. So you search for pictures, this is the first one. And it's kind of a textbook representation of the different components, compartments of the immune system. It is kind of the immune system, but it is really not the immune system. You ask a scientist, what does the immune system look like? And it is this. This is what we, scientists, do when we talk about the immune system. It's a, a mixture of cells inside the tube. We can represent these in very different ways, for as this is a visual representation, but it is completely abstract. It is like a radio astronomer representing things that you kind of see the visual representation of that, but it is, it is a visual representation. We can also uh, are getting more and more complex technology to probe into this is the, the, all the genes that all the cells from a mixture of cells are activated at the same time in a, in a certain individual. Uh, we think that we do the diagrams that are very simple, but even for scientists outside immunology, they hate immunologists because of these simple diagrams that anyone can understand. But immunology is very beautiful things to offer. And, but to appreciate these things, you need to go beyond the visual representation. And one fantastic thing that immunology has to offer, and this is what hooked me into immunology, is the distinction between self and non-self. The immune system evolved along the years to be able to identify our composition, self, 
and distinguish these from what is not self in order to protect us against pathogens but being harmless to our own cells. And this is uh, fantastic. And of course, that's now with transplantation, and that is a representation of a kidney transplant, what evolved to be fantastic is now a big problem because uh, the, the transplant will be identified as non-self. It will be targeted for rejection. And immunology is conceptually beautiful. There are many, many, many concepts that uh, maybe we have considered them in relation with different uh, topics, like memory, you know, memory cells, vaccination induces memory cells, regulation, because if you don't have regulation, you have autoimmunity, cooperation, cells need to cooperate, left alone, the cells do nothing, but you put these two cells together, they, they can do something, aggression, to get rid of a pathogen, but also you cannot be over aggressive or you can develop autoimmunity, and so on, and so on, and so on. Many different concepts. But there is something that I think tops this all up. And that is the fact that lymphocytes, the cells that immunologists love the most, are the only creative cells in the body. Okay? Everybody thinks about neurons when thinking about creativity, but let me tell you, neurons are really overrated. <laughs> <laughs> neurons follow, follow orders. They have genes, and they produce proteins exactly according to the instructions of these genes. And that is not being creative. You know. That is following a template to do something without any sort of creativity. Lymphocytes <laughs> don't do that. Lymphocytes, they change the DNA, okay? And this was what gave the Nobel Prize to Tsutsumu Tonegawa, that found that these different uh, segments of the DNA are rearranging lymphocytes so that each lymphocyte makes a unique protein that no other cell does. This also tells us that not all our cells have the same DNA. That is also a misconception because all the cells have the same DNA except the lymphocytes that alter the DNA to make unique proteins. And why is this important? Because these are the proteins that can recognize the antigens, the proteins that are the com in the composition of the pathogens. Okay? And this takes me to another person that was very important, an Austrian, Lunchsteiner. Lunchsteiner got the Nobel Prize for discovering blood groups. But I think that is far from being his most impressive contribution. For me, his most impressive contribution was the discovery that the immune system is complete. And what I mean is that due to the fact that cells of the immune system change the DNA so that each cell makes a different receptor to a putative protein in a pathogen, what Lunchsteiner did was that started injecting proteins in, I think, rabbits, I don't know exactly what was the animal that he was using, and each protein, you would find that the, the, these animals could produce an antibody against this protein. So it was like vaccinating with different proteins. So he decided to synthesize proteins that do not exist in the universe because of the L and D uh, isomers. And still, for proteins that do not exist in the universe, these rabbits could make antibodies against these proteins. So why is this important? Because we have the ability, due to the creativity of the lymphocytes, to be prepared to respond to anything that exists and anything that does not exist. The virus that causes COVID-19 did not exist three years ago. Yet, all of us, uh, presumably by our own experience, either by infection or vaccination, are living proof that we can make antibodies against these proteins from this virus. Because the way that the immune system evolutionary tackles this evolutionary challenge of organisms that can mutate very quickly is by anticipating any change that can arise. We know that the flu virus from the next season will be different from the flu virus from this season, but we also know that the fact that the immune system covers all possibilities makes it possible to detect 
some cells of the immune system for sure will be able to respond to the flu virus from the next season that no one yet knows what the composition is. And this, for me, is the, is the conceptual thing that is more striking about the immune system. And this is why I can say that the immune system is perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I think the talk is over. We're done. Think about it, and we'll talk later. Um, so this is who I live with, <laughs> and I, I am fortunate enough to live with someone who d who says these things to me. You know, the immune system is perfect. We are talking about the truth. I go, what? You really are not from the humanities because the truth is something else. And you know, we have a lot of very interesting discussions because of statements like this and statements like the ones that he said before. The immune system is the most creative system in our body. Things like that. Being an artist, you know, this provokes me. And it's meant to be provocative. And he does it on purpose. <laughs> and I know that at a certain point, I was sitting there and saying, OK, I'm a lymphocyte. I take things that I've never seen before, and I'll make something out of, you know, I'll make, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll edit the DNA. So after a long time <laughs> of, of, of conversation, I can say as well that I believe art is perfect. Why? Because I actually, it was very inspiring for me to understand a little bit of the immune system and to understand this creativity that is a characteristic of the immune system and understand how it works. And actually, for someone who's been asked the question, what is art? To be able to provocatively say that art is perfect because it's a source of knowledge. It's a field that produces knowledge where everything that has been art is going to continue to be art. And everything that is not yet art, it's ready to become everything that it's going to be. So just like the immune system, it, it keeps everything, and it's just the most inclusive knowledge field that we can possibly have. Nothing is wasted in the arts. Nothing stops being art. Everything is transformed, and it will become art, even if it's not the same. And we cannot anticipate what is going to become art in the future. And this is one of the reasons why I really think that in a knowledge system that is complete, where you have factual knowledge in scientific methodology, uh, um, philosophical knowledge in the humanities, you must have knowledge that the, un the unity is complete. Every knowledge that is produced in everybody that sees an art piece, that talks about an art piece, that makes an art piece, is valid by itself. It doesn't compete, it doesn't need to be correlated, it doesn't need to be consensual in any way. The consensus is one. It just needs to be yours. And if no knowledge system is complete without that individuality, I believe. Okay? So for me, after all of these conversations, after all of this interaction, after understanding a little bit of what Luis deals with and thinks about his passionate field, I was able to actually think, it makes sense, it actually makes sense to make this uh, parallel as well. So this is part of the statement that we wanted to, to say and to talk, but let's be a little bit more, mm, let's give you an example of the things that we do together. Right? So we do discuss a lot, and he's very provocative, and I try to be as provocative as him back. And he won't take art as perfect as a, a given. He will ask me, why? Why do you say that? Um, and we did, so I think the first time we worked together was in 2014. And this is a project that we did together, so we can both talk about it. Um, so 
I was, I, this project started, and I like to talk about my projects as stories because they start and they develop and they grow into something. Um, this project started because I was reading a very interesting book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. If you haven't read it, please do. HeLa cells are the most common cells in laboratories all around the world. There's more HeLa cells which belong to someone <laughs> at a certain point in, uh, um, in her lifetime. Are there are more cells, more HeLa cells now than there ever was at any given time in the body of Henrietta Lacks. And so it's a really interesting story of contemporary science, of, of how we use things and how we make knowledge out of, 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 of these things and why it's important to have HeLa cells all over the, the world and why can't we have different cells all over the world and do experiments with all of these different cells. As an artist who works with biology, part of what I do is what is the question that I'm asking and try to figure out what is the question that I'm asking with this project. Why is it challenging for me in terms of identity? I told you that my focus is identity. And so <clears throat> with reading that book, I decided the idea of, of immortality and how we call immortal cell lines to a group of cells, which are effectively cancer cells, is really interesting to me. Why did they decide to call a cancer an immortal cell line? And I can't reasonably understand it. The reason is why is because the cells, cancer cells, do not have a functioning clock that tells them how to stop, when to stop dividing. So healthy cells have a certain number of cell divisions that happen, and after a certain number of cell divisions, they go into senescence and die. And this is a protection system. This exists because mutations may occur every time cells divide, and you don't want to have too many mutations. So there's this regulatory system, maybe, <laughs> that actually makes sure that we don't have a, 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 a about the word, uh, a, a number of mutations that, it, that can be hindering for us. Cancer cells don't have this regulatory system function in their genes. And so they keep dividing indefinitely. And this is why they were called immortal. It's not that they are not perishable. They are very perishable, just like any other cell. But they don't stop dividing. So indefinitely, they can still divide forever. For a very long time, the only access that we had to this specific cells was by taking samples from cancer patients. Gila Henrietta Lacks was one of such patients. Nowadays, and it's been a few years already, um, you can insert oncogenes into any, almost any cell, and make a cell line an immortal cell line out of those cells. When I learned this, and lo looking into this idea of immortality, I thought, what if I create an immortal cell line out of myself? What does this mean? What does this question? What kind of issues does this raise? And I cannot do it by myself, of course and I cannot do it to myself. So I was stuck in a moment where health and safety uh, became an issue. So you cannot transform your own cells into, and make them into cancer for health and safety reasons, not for ethical reasons, for health and safety reasons. This is a very, uh, uh, a very precise and very important distinction. And, and at this moment when I was trying to progress with this project to try and uh, explore a little bit of the idea of identity within this specific realm, I was uh, stuck with the decision of, do I stop or do I ask someone else to do the, the, the laboratory work for me? And who am I going to ask to do this for me? What, bringing a scientist to do the lab work is meaningful when you're doing an art piece. So 
whoever I brought in would add a dimension to the project that I, want, that I needed to deal with. And this was at the point that I was also thinking, well, we always want to become immortal. It's a human thing, in a way. Not all humans want to be immortal. I, knew, I know that. But it's a, definitely a human thing. We want to overcome age. We want to become immortal through our deeds. We want to become immortal through our children. We, there's always this need to continue on. So what does that mean? And why do we always imagine immortality with a price? And usually, if you think about it, immortal beings that humans have conceived of, and I'm not going to challenge anything in terms of religion, <laughs> but I'm going to say conceive. When you think about an immortal being, they've never been human, because gods have never been human, whoever they are, and or they lose their humanity. They become vampires, they become zombies, they become superheroes but they lose a part of their identity which makes them human. Or they never had it be, be, to, in the first place. So what is this thing that we associate with immortality that is so transformative to our identity? And why usually when you become, why do we want to become immortal ourselves if we do when there's always a price of isolation to, to keep, because if we search for immortality for ourselves, then it means that, that everybody that surrounds us doesn't get it. And so we will become immortal and alone, basically. So this is also a price to pay for immortality. So I wanted to, the, the idea was, how do you bring all of us together? And the solution was there. <laughs> Because why would I want to achieve any kind of immortality or make any kind of exercise in trying to understand immortality without someone I wanted to share that lifespan with, whatever that is. And so I asked Louise, who's a scientist, and who could do, who could make my cells immortal, if he would make this project with me. Do you want to add anything? Yeah. <clears throat> just, just two things. So uh, very simple. One of them is that the, the reason why in the lab uh, a person is not allowed to change their own cells is that is a new reason because if this if these cells that become cancer cells uh, get into the body of this person, the immune system does not perceive these cells as foreign and does not reject these cells. Uh, while if someone in the lab works with cells from a different donor, this can be done in a safe environment because even in the remote possibility that an accident happens, these cells are identified as non-self and as any transplant, they end up being rejected. So when we, we did this uh, project, I, uh, we isolated our blood cells and we, uh, we and I uh, transformed, that is the technical word for it, uh, Martha cells into immortal cell lines, then Martha did the same uh, to me. Making immortal cell lines is something that is relatively straightforward nowadays. In the, in the time of Henrietta Lacks, this was very difficult, and that's why uh, healer cells became so dominant in the world. And the, the problem with this was because she was an African American, she did not consent for these cells to, to be used for science, and this became uh, an ethical uh, dilemma. Uh, in, a, in a time where these things were not discussed and so, so much the focus of our concern as today. Um, it, that's it. So, right. so this is us working in parallel and, and uh, transforming each other's cells. And um, I think the only thing that is missing from this project is that we decided to show it so the strategy for display of a project where the artwork is two cell lines is challenging. It's, it's always com complex. And there are many ways that you can choose to go. For me, personally, as an artist, it's a little bit complicated to put too much technology in the space where you're going to be looking at the artwork. It's a little bit like 
it's complicated to exhibit in a physical space computer art because people look at the computer and if it's a Mac, they will comment that it's a Mac. If it's a PC, they will comment that it's a PC. And you sort of go, this is not the artwork. <laughs> so it's always a little bit complex how much, <laughs> and if you're looking at cells, you always need technology to look at the cells. So how do you overcome this? How do you not bring the whole lab inside the gallery space? Because then people would be looking at the lab and not at the cells, which are the artwork. So my strategy, and I think we was very happy with this, um, and, and so was I, was how can we hide the technology and make the cells the star? Um, so I think we did a pretty good job. Um, so the cells are in flasks like this. And actually underneath each of the flasks, you have a microscope. And you can't see, you can't see the microscope anywhere if you're a member of the public. And this was part of the strategy. So I created with the microscopy um, uh, um, uh, head at the uh, uh, IMM Institute in Lisbon two uh, little microscopes that could be put, placed underneath the cell culture. The cells are alive, and they're under the light. And the two microscopes are connected to computers, and the computers are then connected to two projectors. So what you see on top of the table is actually a live feed of the cells via the microscope, via the computer, and via another piece of technology, which is the projector. But still, I am pretty satisfied that most people do not look at that and think, oh, what a nice projector, or oh, what a nice computer, and how did they go about it? A lot of people ask me, how did you make the microscope? And I tell them, well, you can go underneath the table and check it out, it's fine. But that's not the piece. <laughs> so um, it was very important for us. So the the, the few things that are important, I think, is you have the two projections of the two cell lines on the table. And because this is a piece about immortality together, but always being um, uh, alone because of this, because of this, this uh, uh, immortality transformation, because you lose some of your identity with this. And these are cells from the immune system, because project was done with Luis, and he's an immunologist, and it makes perfect sense that we use cells from the immune system to become immortal together. They are, their job is, and you should know this by now, is to differentiate self from non-self. So they cannot be in the same culture flask together, because they will differentiate, differentiate each other. They will attack each other. So the price for our immortalization in this sense um, was also isolation. The two cell cultures cannot be together. They're on opposite sides of the table exactly to show this, that there was still a price to pay. And the only place where they can be together is in the overlap, the digital overlap of the two projections of the cells. Continuing on, and this is our last project. So maybe I... Oh. <coughs> So, uh, right. So this was the first time that we worked together. It is immortality for two. The second project where we work together is related with transplantation. My uh, PhD was in uh, transplant immunology, and one of the most important figures in this uh, area is a Dutch researcher that died some three years ago called John van Root, and John van Root. Uh, discovered the rules of histocompatibility and he founded Eurotransplant, that is a center in Europe that matches donors and recipients so that they can uh, find a suitable organ to, to be shipped to the, the right recipient, even if this right recipient is somewhere else in Europe. Uh, in Europe being a, a place with many small countries, it was necessary to have a European-wide network Otherwise, the, the, the infrequent uh, match will, will not make it feasible to have match between uh, donors and recipients in small countries. 
But the way he did this was in a fantastic uh, way. So in the late 60s, early 70s, what he was doing to understand how the rules of histocompatibility work was transplanting small bits of skin, like you see here in this uh, diagram, in the four eye or of different lab members. So this is the root here, looking at the microscope, and these are other people in, from the laboratory in, in Leiden. And this is uh, something both of us. Postdocs, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this guy looks too old. Too old for anyway, so they, and, and anecdote about this, so at some point he was stuck because he needed to have uh, individuals with some consanguinity, so to, to, to reduce the diversity. And uh, he realized that one record of uh, marriages of people that, have, that are related to themselves is with the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church, the cousins that want to get married, historically, I don't know if today is the same thing, had to ask permission from the Vatican. So the Vatican had records about these cousins that were getting married. So uh, in a talk that we attended, that was very inspirational, he, he said that, well, if you are stuck with a problem, you send a letter to the Pope. So you send a letter to the Pope asking permission to have access for, to this information in order to advance his research. They took uh, more than one year to review the, the case and they agreed to get in touch with these people and to ask if these people wanted to participate in this study. And this was critical to, for the understanding of this histocompatibility. Anyway, this is a, a, a small deviation. So what we decided to do in this respect was also to, uh, as another way to have a, a, a dialogue between ourselves and our identity, was to reproduce these experiments that was done in the 70s in our own four arms. And maybe Martha can explain this a little bit better. I don't know. Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> So I also want to comment that the experiments were done in the 60s. I don't think it would have been possible to do such experiments today. I don't think there would be any uh, uh, um, uh, ethical committee that would approve, approve anything like that. So um, I, we're very fortunate that they happened anyway. Um, and it was very interesting to see John Barnaby explaining these things uh, quite late in his career. So, I, Luis doesn't tell you the story like this, but this is this is why we're different, and this is this is why we work together, and we're not the same. Sorry, person. Um, we went to see John Van Roon, and then we got home, and I remember distinctly. He remembers it differently, so it's we're married. That's what happens. Um, uh, I remember that when we were going to bed that night, he said, "Why don't we do a transplant?" And he wanted to do a transplant where he, I would transplant my skin to his forearm. And it was a little bit of a dispute to explain, well, which I won. And he will tell you I always win. Um, and I will tell you no. Um, that it would not be a real art project for the both of us if it was an, ex an exchange of skin. Okay, so. I think I don't exactly what arguments I used or what blackmail I used to um, to get him to uh, see it my way, but it was an exchange of, of, of transplants. And for me personally, as an artist, and I've told you before, my my issue has to do with identity. It was really interesting to do a project like this because you know the immune system recognizes you from before your brain does. It's completely separate from self-awareness. When you're in your mother's womb, your immune system already knows and recognizes you and recognizes everything that is not you. And so it's really interesting in terms of identity 
to think that identity goes that deep in some ways because we are we do associate self and identity with self-awareness and with cognizant um, uh, uh, cognizance um, and so to be able to actually perform an experiment where you can actually see the result happening where your body is effectively saying no this is not you so we will not feed it uh, which is what happens here so you have on day two a transplant and you have self transplant and uh, Luisha skin here and you have my um, Luisha skin here and my skin here and to follow the process where the body says no I'm not feeding one of these and it starts to get black and it eventually falls off is effectively seeing the immune system in action saying nope, this is not you so I'm not going to feed that <laughs> I'm not going to give it uh, nutrients and oxygen and anything that it needs it's just going to have to drop off uh, and for me in terms of identity but also for me personally it was really interesting to go through a process where we're doing a project together and we're married and we love each other and we know all these things and we this is an affirmation of that love in a way but it's also a affirmation of self which for me in a relationship is actually incredibly important I do not want to lose my identity because I am together with Luis, I never did. And sometimes I do need to remind myself that I am me and not us. So both personally and as an artist, this was a very important uh, project for me to deal with issues of identity and what do we understand as our identity when he transforms me every day, when I transform him every day that we're together and we still choose to be together despite and for all those transformations. So for me, this was very much about this very out of my uh, uh, awareness affirmation of self. So it goes deeper than me telling him, we're not, I'm not you, I'm, I'm not just us, I am me. Having two children together, this is also an issue because I'm not only the mother, I'm also Mark. And being a mother, you go through this a lot. Uh, and but Luis has a completely different perspective because he's an immunologist, and probably because he's more romantic than I am. <laughs> so why not you? Yes, for me, one of the aspects of this that is also that connects with the previous project is the fact that uh, by doing this process, we acquire uh, a new sense, a sixth sense, that forever we'll be able to recognize the other. So when I started talking about the immune system, I told you about the ability of the immune system to uh, adapt to anything that shows up, to a new virus, and also to a transplant that was never seen before. And the consequence of this is the creation of antibodies that are specific for that transplant that you can say to that person and it forever will carry this molecular uh, sense, this molecular ability to recognize the other. So we, we start More having for us. something, an antibody, that can uh, forever recognize the other. And as Martha says, if we in the future need a transplant for clinical reasons, this may be an additional challenge because it reduces the number of donors that we will be able to, to to, to, to accept, but uh, that I think is also something interesting about the immune system is a, a, a memory and a, a sensorial system, but that senses things not visually or uh, through audition, but at the level of molecular structure of those things. I, this is this is the last slide, and the video is a little bit long, and I, I don't think you want to. Um, let's go for questions, and if if you want to see the video, we can play the video. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
connection between the epigenetic and the lymphocytes? Yeah, the, so, the, so we, we now know, we now know that there are several levels of the regulation of gene expression. And one of the levels in which the, the genes are regulated is how the machinery that are important to make a protein out of a gene can access this uh, gene. And this can be influenced by these epigenetic uh, changes. It, this affects the immune system as well as all cells in the body. And we know that as an immune cell acquires a particular function, it may be locked in this function by epigenetic changes that create kind of a barrier for this cell to, uh, to lose this function and to become uh, more aggressive or less aggressive. But this is a, a level of regulation that is common to most biological systems. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, how did you exhibit the last the last piece? That's because it's your arms, right? So. And by the way, can it's you still see it? <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend and a colleague who uh, put a, an ear on his left arm, and it's. His name is Stellark, if you haven't heard about him. And the ear has a microphone, so it actually hears. <laughs> um, but it's a very funny because the, every picture with Stellark nowadays is with him <laughs> holding his arm up. Um, but by the way, the microphone got infected. In no, it, it's already there again. Here it is again. <laughs> Um, um, so the piece, the, it was difficult to decide, again, very good question, uh, because it was a question that we had while we were doing the project. We knew it was going to be a surgery, a one-time thing, I'm not going to go under surgery for this ever again, and it was already a, quite a big decision to do it the first time, so um, how are we going to exhibit something that happens once, actually in this case, the antibodies may be considered the art piece and the antibodies are inside us. So we're the ones that are carrying the art piece around with us. So how do you show something like this? So even when we were preparing, preparing to do the surgery, I knew that we had to do great documentation. That's the, st the best strategy to overcome anything, right? So uh, we knew that we're going to have to um, to uh, ideally, the first option was, and it was, it's still the, the best option, was to do a documentary of, of the piece. So the, the video that you have here is actually a short version of a, a 12, I think it's 12 minute video, this is a five minute, um, uh, where we hired a, a, a documentarist to do a documentary of the piece, and she was incredible. She was absolutely incredible. Um, she uh, talked to both of us, and eventually came to back to us with this idea that we should have a double, um, double video, a dual video piece, where the two of us would show as separate entities at the beginning, and progressively the two images of the two videos would match. Uh, and, and, and it was really amazing to understand how do you construct a narrative visually and how do you convey ideas without it being explicit in the conversation between the two people. So she conveyed so much about the piece just by making this little video um, that just the video itself is a way, of, a strategy to, to show the piece but um, at a certain point, it, it felt, I, I try to avoid showing pieces just as documentation, and I can't sit myself there to um, allow people to poke me and ask me questions most of the time. So um, how were we going to make sure that we could somehow allow the public to experience what it was to do the, the surgery, to, to see your skin being put in someone else's arm. And what does that mean? What does that trigger inside of you? 
this is when we decided that we needed to record the surgery from the top. So we recorded the surgery, um, and the surgeon was incredibly <laughs> happy. Well, he was very helpful, allowing us to, you know, now you can't do anything because we need to change the battery for the GoPro. <laughs> it's like, okay. Um, so he was uh, incredibly generous with, with his time. And so the strategy became to, next to the documentary of, of the piece that explains all of the context of the piece, you have a table uh, where the surgery is being protected. And you are invited to sit at that table and put your arm so the table is black, not, not like that one. The table is actually black, so you don't see the surgery very well if nobody's there. But if someone puts their arm there, you suddenly see the surgery happening on that person's arm. And that is very impactful. Actually, it was a very happy idea that we had to, to do this. It, it, is, it is very, very impressive because the, the arm acts as a screen, and it is three-dimensional it is very realistic to have this projection on, on top of, 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 of the person's own arm. So for some people it is very disturbing, they are not very comfortable with it. I'll just speak out. <laughs> Thank you, this is very interesting work. But I'm wondering, Marta, you probably know uh, Edward Kack yeah. and his work of injecting bioluminescence into a rabbit. I know when that was done, what? Sorry, I will explain, don't worry. Yeah, and I might not have said that correctly, but. Um, so that, there was a lot of flack of, of negative, not, there was interest and there was also negative reaction from part of society, and I wonder if you and Luis have had to uh, deal with a surrounding public part of it that is um, challenging why you're doing this, or ethically, it, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Eduardo's uh, artwork yeah. was, so he created a transgenic rabbit where he introduced the gene for a fluorescent protein, GFP, that fluoresces only under um, right. UV lights, mm -hmm. and usually under fur you cannot see uh, that much. So usually this rabbit, also a problem was that the the, the scientific collaborators, they half, halfway through the process, they started having concerns about the publicity about this because it, this was in the early 2000s and genetic engineering was very controversial at that time. So this uh, banning was not released uh, from the laboratory, so it was never seen or exhibited. Uh, what uh, what we know, because there are many mice that have, that were created for many different purposes, and there are many mice that have this GFP protein, and now even other fluorescent proteins, and because of the fur you can only see the tail, the ears, so the the, the exposed skin that fluorescing and the uh, UV lights. Uh, concerning these projects, we did not have any any big concerns. I don't think that the fact, if you consider that this was a procedure that was already done in the 60s, so it was safe, and besides this was not something that was done for clinical reasons or whatever, so it is not very different from people that are involved in body modification with tattoos or with other types of body modification uh, that, that do, so it is not so much uh, challenging, I guess. So I would, I would also like to say, so it's not just that the scientists rethought something, it's also that they realized that part of the project that Eduardo had, I, I know Eduardo personally and he's a friend, I actually admire his work a lot, and a lot of the um, uh, artists who were affected by this bad reputation. It did not fare so well in terms of friendship with Eduardo, but I, I can say that we're good friends. Um, uh, the, the thing is, if you have a genetically modified organism, you cannot just take it out of the lab. This is not allowed by law. <laughs> so even if they did 
at a certain point thought that this would would, be, would have been a, 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 an interesting idea to a, to explore the issues that Eduardo was raising with this fluorescent animal, um, they would not be allowed to do so. Uh, and, and part of the project afterwards became this miscommunication tech, uh, campaign to free this uh, Alba uh, rabbit from the lab and be uh, hosted by Eduardo as a pet at home. This relates to a project that he did before, which is K9, K9 which was how are we going to, which is very pertinent even still today, which is how are we going to deal with these organisms who are being genetically modified to be pets, right? Not just the ones that are being modified for scientific research, but there is a potential for uh, economic gain by producing these organisms that are uh, that don't cause uh, allergies, for instance. And there's a whole uh, range of animals that have been sold. I think the company is now off, but there was a company in the United States that was uh, producing animals that were genetically modified to uh, not express a specific protein which is responsible for the uh, allergy that we suffer from cats and, and dogs. And they were tr selling these, these animals. It, to go from there to a genetically modified organism that is bought just because it's green, fluorescent green, was the initial question that Eduardo was asking. And this is also why the campaign to release Alba, which was the, day, the name that he gave to the rabbit, from the laboratories was so pertinent in terms of how are we going to deal with this reality when it occurs, you know? And after um, a project that he did after that, which was called The Eighth Day, he actually managed to get authorization to produce animals specifically for the art piece. So Alba was not specifically produced for the art piece. Uh, to produce organisms specifically for the art piece that expressed GFP in most of their cells, because most of these animals don't express GFP in all of the body, because that would be useless for science. Um, and they had authorization to show it in a gallery space. But then after showing it in the gallery space, they had to go back to the lab. Um, how much of your art, as you say, is driven by uh, uh, ideas you had before you ever entered a particular lab versus your kind of reaction or to things you experienced in the lab or learned in the lab? Um, so it's, it has to do with how long I've been in labs. <laughs> so at the beginning, it was very much a matter of uh, being exposed to a specific uh, uh, research project. So I actually started by making paintings of things in the lab. And this is what got me in the lab and, and what got me talking to the scientists. And actually what got me interested in the science itself and not just the aesthetic amazingness or out-of-worldness that a, a scientific lab is nowadays that was so different from what I had experienced as a student was that the scientists, whenever they were showing me around, they were telling me, oh, but this is an amazing machine. And I would look at the machine and I would go, that's an ugly machine. It's like, <laughs> and there, I, there's nowhere I'm going to do anything with that machine because it's because machines in labs are ugly. There's no aesthetic value in any of them. They're all the same color. It's a little bit like a hospital. They're all this beige color with signs in red and yellow <laughs> and black. and and you look at the scientists and they're almost jumping up and down telling you how this NMR machine does wonderful things for the research or this cell sorting machine does amazing things for the research and you go, okay, there's something there. I want to poke that because they're so excited that it really must be interesting. And this is the shift that happened instead of doing paintings of what I was looking at in the lab. I started looking into, okay, explain to me, please, what does this machine do that is so amazing? And it's sometimes not even the machine that does amazing things. It's what they can do with the machine that is amazing. And so this is when the shift happened to, okay, when I'm in the lab, I want to hear them talk about their research because this is when the click happens. This is when someone who's talking about 
therapeutical vaccines over lunch. And I go, what the hell do you mean a therapeutical vaccine? A vaccine is something to prevent infection. It's not a therapy. Why do you put those two words together? And this is when a project starts to try and understand what does that mean? Why is it so different from what I understand it? And I'm always the I'm always a test subject because I'm the one that is not a scientist and I'm not involved in the science and haven't been involved in the science for a very long time. So with me, they can, they can, they can understand or get a, a glimpse of, oh, that's what other people think that we're doing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, that's how they see it. And, and this may be actually useful for them. But, uh, but this is when, this is when a, a project usually starts. Um, so nowadays it's not just being, so I still love going to the labs and I love spending six months in the lab and focusing on a specific experiment that I'm trying to make happen with someone or not. But most of my ideas now come from listening to talks, reading papers, or just talking to, because now it's not just listening to talks, it's going for dinner with the scientists because it's been, 23 years, um, so there's no way I don't go for dinner with multiple different scientists. And, and he, there's no way he doesn't go for dinner with multiple different artists, and it has changed him. <laughs> yeah, but answering to your question, since Martha could not answer to your question, <laughs> sometimes she comes with an idea to the scientists and collaborates to work towards that IBM. This is a good example with that. Sometimes she responds to something that she found. And a good example for that, for example, was the bacteria that you found that degrade textile dyes that you are amazing, that are amazing, and to, for bioremediation of the textile industry. And she created paintings with these textile dyes that during the course of the exhibition, they slowly disappear the colors because of the bacteria eat the colors. Okay, so you have examples of the two. Yes. Maurice, how has uh, working with Marta and art changed your scientific worldview? It did not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I think, I think that it changed not, not especially the, the, not the, the, the group the itself. The worldview. The group, it, the group itself. I think that one thing that it, it, that it makes us, and it makes uh, even the junior members of the team, is to be more uh, realizing what are the broad implications of what they're doing. So very often, when people are in a research project, because of course that's in, in a PhD or whatever, this project is very specialized, there is a, ten a tendency for us to over-specialize and to look uh, very narrowly into the project that we are dealing. So we know everything about these three proteins and we don't know what is the broad implications of these three proteins that we are studying. And I think that the, the, the interaction with artists uh, makes everybody in the team more uh, sure about the position of their research in the broad context of, uh, of the biomedical field. And I think that is very, very important. Uh, and I think that has been a, a very big advantage. Sorry, he won't say that he's um, finding the truth anymore. Okay? <laughs> that, is, that is something he won't say. So I think that is definitely, a, a, because you've had too many discussions with, with my colleagues to, to say that what you say is true. Uh, I, I will not answer that because this would take us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I also, I think you're, um, this is, has nothing, does anybody have another question? Yes, go ahead. But I want to hear your thought first. It's just that um, I, I put there as well, one of the things that I most often ask is what does art have to contribute to science when, when an artist is in a lab? And I say nothing. And I mean nothing. Science is perfectly able to do their job. Uh, what I would like to be asked as well is what does scientists have to contribute to art? 
and I would say nothing, just the same. I'm not, when, when I'm collaborating with, with a scientist, I'm not looking to make science, and I don't expect the scientists to make art. Having said that, the, artist, the, the scientists may want to make art, and I actually think that, for instance, the project that we did together, this last one, in terms of concept, it was a very big leap. I could see Luis contributing to the concept behind the piece in, the, in a very different way than he did for Immortality for Two, for instance. Okay, so I always uh, write him as a co-author, and I feel that he is a co-author in, in and if you want to go in the scientific term, we are first um, and last uh, <laughs> um, authors of the papers, the paper being the, the art piece, uh, because we both work very hard for, for the project in our own fields. But I, I do say that what I want to achieve is artistic knowledge. What I want to bring forward is artistic knowledge, not scientific knowledge, because I don't... <laughs> and Luis often tells uh, uh, fun stories about this. Is For me, one is enough. For an art piece, one is enough. For science, one is never enough. There's no statistical relevance to be had for something that occurs once. And for an art piece, all I need is for it to happen once. When I was looking at the chromosomes inside human cells um, and, and deciding which color to use to stain them and make them visible, for me, and I was trying to make a pattern, for me, in thousands of cells, if one of them had that pattern, it was enough for the art piece. For the scientists I was collaborating with, I had to do that as a second part of the project, because when I was in the microscope looking at millions of cells to see if there was a pattern that was repeated, and if they could actually uh, see what was the statistical relevance of that chromosome being in that place in this many cells versus not being in that place in that many cells, I had to do this without trying to look for the pattern. I had to train myself to go into the lab, to go into the microscope room, and think, I am not going to look for the pattern. I'm going to just take random images of as many cells as I can to see if, if I can then do any kind of correlation. And it was really difficult, because I was looking for a specific pattern for my art piece, and it was really difficult to go, no, you're not going to look around. Okay, you're not going to browse through to see if you can find that cell that does the, pro the pattern that you're looking for. And this is a very important distinction. For, for art, if it happens once, <laughs> it's perfect. If it happens twice, maybe we can do two artworks with the same thing, but it's not really that important. For science, if it happens only once, it's meaningless. <laughs> it has no meaning. Uh, and, and so this is why I say there's nothing I can contribute as an artist. I can contribute as a technician. I can do microscopy. I can do lab uh, bench work and things like that. But the outcome that I'm looking for is very, very different, even if I'm asking similar questions. Just to say, for the scientists among here that are considering an artist, uh, artists make very good technicians. They <laughs> <laughs> have a great uh, eye-hand coordination. <laughs> they can do tough things very easily. <laughs> True. True. We're trained for that. I'm intrigued with the relationship between the speculative and the applied in your work. Mm. Are there some instances where you come up with an idea that may be too risky to become an applied project, applied science, mm -hmm. and do you sometimes consider projects that would be purely speculative? Um, I'm, I'm just curious also about how these projects are applied, but make me think of many speculative scenarios. This is the wonderful thing about art, right? Is we can be as speculative as possible. The scientists can speculate, but they always need to go back to, okay, let's see if we can make prove this or disprove this. 
Um, uh, actually, one of my projects that I did with CRISPR is not exactly speculative, but it is. So all of you realize that the ethical implications of any of these works are humongous. There's no way around. And it's part of the game. If you're doing work with manipulating living organisms, the ethical part is a given, and it should never be discarded. Um, I have one project um, where, um, so in CRISPR, you can very precisely edit a very small portion of the gene. And one of my projects is exactly about making decisions about that. So what um, the strategy was, can I find an example where um, a, a, a mutation happens that can be reversed through CRISPR? And, and I found one. So the, the, there's a, the, the very um, basic or very common laboratory mouse, which is the bald C, um, was actually first used as a product for sale to labs in the world in um, 1920. And the, 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 the bald C strain was actually created by the Amateur Society for, Anim for Mice Breeding in the UK. And they, and, and, and so they created these mice which are so inbred that they're genetically identical. And it's a strain and it's very useful, uh, um, it's a very useful material for science, right? And so they started being bought and, and they're everywhere in the world. At a certain point, uh, between then and 1980, a natural, uh, a spontaneous mutation occurred to one gene that gave rise to a different strain, strain of, of, my, of mice. And that one gene, that one very small mutation that was not ed edited or engineered or purposeful, it was spontaneous mutation, gave, gave rise to two consequences in that mouse. The mouse became hairless and this is now called the nude mouse, and, um, and it doesn't, it's, it's severely ethymic, so it doesn't have a functioning thymus, and therefore it doesn't have an, a functioning immune system. And so it's very important for immunology studies because it doesn't have an immune system. Um, but it was interesting for me for several reasons. One, it was a very specific mutation, it was a spontaneous mutation. It wouldn't exist if it hadn't occurred in a lab because a, a mouse with a, without an immune system would have died if it was, so we don't know if it happened elsewhere. But if it was in the wild, this animal would not have survived and would not give, uh, would not originate a whole strain of animals the same. And because you already have, so CRISPR is a complex of, of things and you have a template, or well, actually I should start the other way around. You have uh, the, the scissors, which cut the DNA. And then you have a guide RNA, which tells the scissors where to cut the DNA inside the nuclei. And then you have a template, which is what you want the cell machinery to use to repair the DNA. So if you cut the, the, the DNA, it tends to repair itself, and you want to give it a um, a model for it to repair with. And this is how you insert DNA into uh, these organisms. And so you already have, this is basically a complex of molecules that are mostly for sale. And you can just start, you can buy them from companies and tell them, okay, I want the template to look like this. So in principle, and the piece is all about this, you have a mouse that has hair and looks healthy, which uh, incurred into, with a, uh, incurred into a, a, a spontaneous mutation which made it very fragile because it doesn't have an immune system. They also took its hair, which I like because if it's just the hair, then why change it? But if it's a, a, an immune system, you want to make it healthy. And you have the tools to make it into a ball C again. So the piece is all about this diagram where the public is put into 
play to make that decision. What decision would you make? Would you uh, do genetic engineering, genetic editing to these organisms to make it healthy again? But what if it was just the hair? Would you have the same decision? And, and you cannot really separate the both. So the decision cannot be made, oh, if it's for health, yes, but if it's for uh, aesthetic reasons, then no. And, and this is what we're doing all the time. So this is, and again, I, I haven't uh, answered your question because when I show this piece, I have cages for the animals in the space, inside the diagram. And I never put uh, mice in there. And it was on purpose, it was an ethical decision. This piece is all about ethics. I'm going to put animals on display. I think that would be very un reasonably unethical of me. Um, and so I never put it. But every time I show it, people come to me, I saw the mouse. I go, really? I'm sorry, but you couldn't help. I said, yes, it's there, it's hiding. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, it was very interesting because throughout all my career, people ask me, why do you make the experiments? Why do you actually perform the manipulation of, of the organisms? Why, why, why? And I always have a, a reason. And at this time, I never did the mouse. I just, I, because the piece is about what choice would you make? It's not what choice would I make? It's what choice would you make when faced with this ethical dilemma? So I don't need to make the mouse. I just need to ask the question in the right way. So sometimes speculative, speculative is even, and, and this is the proof that they see the mouse there, when there's never been any mouse there, is the proof that this, even the speculation can be an incredibly powerful tool to, to put people where I want them to, 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 to make sure that they ask the question that I want them to ask. In fact, way, this mutation uh, happens in, in people. There are, the last time I've seen, there were three recorded cases, uh, only one alive in, in the hospital where I work. It was a, a young girl that received a, a tiny transplant. It's I must say, I've listened to a one-hour talk this morning about CRISPR. It was much better explained. <laughs> <laughs>